All right, looks like we're here. Um, well, I thought I'd share a fun milestone um, that I reached with the compiler recently. So if I do a release build here and now run the compiler. Um, so I'm actually going to run the compiler against a, a directory. You can see here a proj here, it should be like a project has a main and a util file. So if I compile that directory, you can see that it works. Um, if I time that whole run, it's pretty fast uh, so far, which is nice. I mean, it's a really small program, but still neat that it's, it's that fast. And so what I've done is that's built this whole directory. The compiler has seen that we've passed a directory instead of a file, and now it's going to look in there for a um, for a file called main and a function called main in there and everything else is just going to be considered part of the root module. There's nothing special about a file. So there's a file here util by default anything in here in this root of this file is the same as if it were in the file main. Um, the files themselves don't do anything at all. Um, I probably misspoke earlier even when I said it looks for a main function in main. It just looks for a main function in the root namespace. So the files are just for you, basically. You can put things in files. You cannot put things in files. It makes no difference to the compiler. So in order to achieve this, I added a pass. I did a, like a pre-declaration pass in the type checker, which is the only pass I've added. Previously, it was... From the time parsing was done, there was a single type checking pass, and then code gen all happens in a single pass. So everything had to be sort of top down, that classic single pass compiler problem um, where we can't pre declare, where we would need to pre declare things, although you can't in this language. So I'm going to walk through the implementation of that, but firstly, I guess we can just demo. So now in um, util out, we have. And you know, little things like the, the binary is called a proj, which is the name of the directory. So the directory becomes the module name um, in this directory mode. Now, if I, if I point the compiler at a file, it knows that it's a file and then it treats it as a single file program still. So if I run this project, I get hello from root util and then hello from util hello. Um, if we cat main, you can see that it's doing this and then it's accessing this namespace from util file. This is also defined in util, but you can see it's it's not namespaced automatically. You have to actually make a namespace if you want. I'm thinking about doing a namespace um, util like a statement at the top so that your whole module doesn't need to be, your entire file, entire file doesn't need to be nested, you know, one level in. I like declaring a package, but I think Rust does this when you say mod, whatever, or at least before, back in the old days, I feel like there was something like this in, in Rust where you would just say mod blank and then semicolon rather than open open up a block there. But anyway, um, I'm really, really happy with it. I'm, I'm proud that I got it working. The other thing I've done is I'm interning the expressions in the parser. So every expression is just pointed to by an ID now. And then those IDs are what are stored like an if else instead of having three expressions um, heap allocated inside of it, just now has three expression IDs that it points to for its condition, consequent, and alternate expression. So that's a big win for the um, stack size of all those structs. There's some annoyance with having to look up expressions by ID, and there's a place where I'm having to do some clones because I have, you know, borrows now, um, basically, to the, to the expression pool when I want to look at an expression of a reference to it. So just Rust things. I think once I in turn uh, blocks and statements as well, though, um, as is the plan, not just to do expressions, then those clones will be so cheap that it really won't matter. Um, yeah, so really happy with that design. So um, let's just jump into it. So I haven't ever really spent any time in main in these videos because it's really not all that interesting. But might as well go ahead and do it here since since a lot of a good bit of the change was here. There's really nothing special. We have some static assert size. Um, these can probably go outside of main, actually. I don't think that those need to be in here. We, we debug print our command line arguments first thing. 
Um, we hard code the out dir to BFL out in, in main as well. We make a inkwell context and we call compile module. Um, which is defined above. Um, main used to have a lot more in it, but it's kind of all been moved into compile module. And then if you did pass run, um, the compiler will also then run the program. This is just for my own convenience. It's kind of weird for a compiler to run, but um, it's kind of nice to just one command run things. So, but at least now I've moved that out of this compile module, which is cleanly separated. And this is, this is really how we compile. So we take the inkwell context Unfortunately, we, we, we have to take this in. Um, we could maybe initialize it in here, but then we couldn't return the code gen um, because of the lifetimes. Um, anyway, uh, the args and then the outdoor. So that's customizable from here. And here you can sort of see this, um, this idea that, okay, is it a directory or is it not? So if you point out a directory, then, um, then that is the source dir and the module name is a directory name. If you didn't, then the source directory is actually the parent of um, the file you provided um, because the code below only knows how to scan a directory. And then what we do in directory mode is we actually just do this, this filtering. So in single file mode, we, we go up a folder and then we just only compile the file that you specified. So a little bit of a, hack but not too bad just so that i can have one code path down here for um once we get down by the time we're here we don't really know the difference between directory mode and non we're simply saying hey only can only compile this one file in this directory um, the module name of course in that case if it was not a directory is simply going to be the file stem of the uh the provided file i can go ahead and demo single file mode so that's going to be a um, uh, advent of code one will do. We compile single file. Um, that, that's created um, a binary called AOC one. So the, the module name is, is correct. And yeah, so to make this work, what we've done is we've reworked parsed module. All of this is a little bit different now, but essentially you, we initialize it now just with the name um, and, and it does its initialization. Really nothing has happened yet. It's just sort of empty. We don't pass in the file because now the idea is you make a module and you can feed it as many source files as you want. It's just going to keep parsing them all into the same structure. It's, one, it's all one module. So we create a closure here, parse file, um, that it creates a source. Source is my abstraction for a source file. So very importantly, we have a file ID. We use this for spans. Um, I guess I can show off. So if I introduce a type error into my multi-file um, my multi-file project. Uh, okay, so hello says it returns an int, but it doesn't. And compile a proj. Let's not time it. We can see error at main.bfl. Okay, so we actually get type errors in two places. Because we, we, we do the pre decal pass, so we actually know that this is declared to return an int. And so in main, where we're calling it, we get a type mismatch because we know hello should return an int. And then in the body of hello, we say, hey, you said you would return an int, but you're returning a string. <coughs> Both of these errors are good. Um, so this is just a result of the fact that we accumulate errors rather than just fail the whole thing as we, as we type check, which is nice. I want to do more with that even toying with ideas of succeeding the compilation, but just putting interrupts where there were type errors so that you can run a broken program. A really interesting idea um, that I think would be cool for productivity. But yeah, two errors. We can go back here, revert this to string. Um, but how do we know the right? We see that these came the correct file, the correct line number. So what's happened here is we have a source for each file we've compiled, and then the parsed module um, maintains a 
source says, which is a hash map of file ID to source. Um, I just have shared ownership of these sources just for convenience because um, they never change. And this is really nice. So you, we just um, every span has a file ID on it. So you don't really need to do more than hey say hey span which file and then go get the source. Um, and that's how we're able to do um, source excerpts here with in the uh, compile error. So that's really nice. Um, back. So we make a source and then we we lex it. We make a parser uh, from the lexed tokens. Uh, copy the pointer to the source. Um, so a parser is a short-lived thing. It's basically just an iterator over this token back, um, and it takes the parsed module mutably. This is the big change, right? So this thing used to return a parsed module, which was assumed to only be one file, but now we pass it in, and the idea is, hey, like just parse more into this module. Um, and that's what this does. Um, it extends the parsed modules definitions at the end. And most of the time it's parsing, it's updating um, stuff that the parsed module shares. It shares um, it shares an identifier and expression pool with the parsed module as well. So this, this struct doesn't really need to exist. Um, this struct parser could really just be a function because all it really is is a pointer to a module and a token vec. Um, so yeah, at this point, I think we can just get rid of it, but that's what we have. Um, Yeah, we print errors and push them. We return OK. This is to get the closure to be typed correctly. Um, <clears throat> this is was the big motivation for multi-file, the prelude. So previously, I had to slam this in the front of the single source file. But now you can see it's prelude.bfl. It's not a string in a Rust file, and it's in the built-ins directory. So this is just you know, a, um, a bona fide library um, uh, written in the source language that we simply say, hey, if, if we're compiling with Prelude, then uh, parse it, parse it into the module, uh, just like any other file. Um, I wonder if we could do this at the beginning, if it better be better for the Prelude to come at the beginning, but this proves that our pre-declaration stuff works because we have a bunch of stuff that uses the, no, this is just declaring the closure, so we are loading the prelude first. And then for each dir entry that we're compiling, we call our closure on it, making sure that um, this is where we assign the file IDs, and, and I am sorting these so it's like deterministic across runs. Um, which file ID you get. If there were parse errors, then we're going to fail. I'll say parsing failed. And then <clears throat> the rest of this is, is really irrelevant, hasn't really changed, um, because we're ending up with a single typed module. I didn't do... If we ever have multiple modules, they'll probably be separate modules, and I'll have to like tangle with that. For now, though, we're just parsing into one module, even though you can have as many files as you want. We have namespaces inside modules, so you can still be plenty modular. You just can't do like fully separate compilation units. Maybe at that point, we're just linking, linking libraries. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of it for the uh, parser. Maybe we could go into a little bit of how this works, but none of this has really changed. Probably now the pre-declaration phase is the most interesting part. So um, if we go to eval module, which doesn't exist, So I have to find I have to find the entry point of type checking. Um, maybe we can find it from main. Type to module run. Okay. So this is no longer to do. All right. Um, this has changed a good bit. So this is our run and our type checker. Um, we're running on a parsed module, and we um. So for every definition in the AST, and definition is our, um, the things you can define at a namespace level, 
So that's functions, constants, type defs, and other namespaces. We say for every definition, we call eval definition, which is a function we already had, but we now passing in declaration phase true. Now I thought about just making entirely separate functions like eval function predecal, eval definition uh, predecal or something rather than using a flag, but I opted to use a flag because most stuff is the same. So we just have eval definition, which of course is going to match on the type of definition and then um, do some things. So for eval name for namespace, we just call eval namespace um, and we say that we're in the declaration phase. So if we hop in here, we'll see that um, only in the declaration phase, um, I actually did this, only in the declaration phase do we create a namespace. Really, namespace is all about defining symbols. So um, we do most of the work only in the declaration phase. If it's not the declaration phase, then we look up the ID of the namespace. So this is a new thing that we added to, to make the predecal phase work. So as we do the declaration phase, every time we create a declaration for something that was in the AST, we add an entry. We say this AST definition maps to this. <coughs> this typed definition. All variants have the same postfix ID. Yeah, that's an interesting observation, but I don't know if that should be a linter, linter warning. So what does this look like for a namespace? Well, you know, we add it to the scope. We do all the work. We make we make the namespace, right? Um, and then, okay, this creates a scope, and then we, we add the namespace to scope we're in, add it to our name, intern the namespace. And then this is kind of the new part. So we insert it into definition mapping so that when we come back here, when we're not in the declaration phase, we'll find it. We'll have the ID and then we can continue on. So for every definition in the namespace, well, we're going to call eval definition, which is where we started. So namespace is kind of the weird recursive case where it really just holds other things. So if we go back to the definition, we covered namespace, now const. So you can't do much in consts in this language. Like I could do like the whole const expert thing, but the idea is they can't depend on other definitions. So um, we do all the work in the declaration phase for consts. We don't, we don't worry about coming back and doing because we know that a const can only hold a literal, I think. Or maybe, maybe you can add two numbers together. I don't think you even can. I think it's just literals. So. Um, we can just do const in the declaration phase, as the comment suggests. So for a function def, this is the big doozy. Um, if it's declaration phase, then what I've done is I, ha I have split what was eval function into two functions, um, basically split it like in half. Everything that it was doing in the first half is now the pre-declaration phase. This is type checking it's typing the arguments and the type arguments of the function itself, declaring it, making the function, adding it um, to the scope, creating a scope for it, doing all of that. Everything but the body of the function. So we don't want to evaluate the body of the function because in the body, we may be calling a function or referencing something that we haven't seen yet, right? We're in the declaration phase. So the whole point of a declaration phase is to skip the function bodies. So. If it's in the declaration phase, we call eval function predecal. We pass in the function AST node, what scope we're in, we're not specializing, and a bunch of other flags. Um, it's not a known intrinsic. Uh, we don't have a new name. These these three args could be collapsed into. Um, actually, these four args could be combined into one, where we could call it like. Um, dot on specialization args because you either have all of them or you don't um, this none false none none looks looks sad but anyway so function predecal uh, that none of this has changed this is all as it was before and 
okay if we're not specializing. We add it to the scope we're in and we insert the definition mapping so that when we come back in to evaluate the body, we can pick up where we left off and look up this function that we've done all this work to put in here. We just haven't done a block yet. So we say, okay, function. Now, um, later on our second pass, we're going to come back and it's not going to be the declaration phase. And we're going to say, okay, well, what's the AST ID of this function definition? Go to the definition mappings table and get the function ID, the stub, basically. We're looking up the function stub that we that we already created. And now we're going to call eval function on that. Eval function now just takes an ID. It's a declared function, so I called it declaration ID. And um, this is this is all just copying out fields of the function stub. This is looking up the AST definition because we, we have the, the AST ID. Um, we have it on the function stub that we stored. So it's like going, looking up back the other way to get the AST because we need the block off it because if the user did put an implementation in here, well, that's our whole job. Our whole job now is to like type check the implementation of the function. So we do that. Um, this is unchanged. If there's a block, we, we type check the block. If there's no block, that's okay if it's an intern or extern function. And then um, otherwise, we say this function is missing an implementation. We look up the function again and store the block that we just type checked on it. <clears throat> and okay, we are done. And now specialize is is um is a little bit different. So when we're specializing a function, we kind of um we're doing it at a call site and it's a generic function that's been called and we want to we want to do the pre-decal and the eval all at once for a specialized version so that's exactly what we do we say hey do a pre-decal i'm specializing so that changes a lot of things with how we do the function pre-decal we substitute variables and scopes and things like that we do that that's our declaration id and then we immediately turn around and eval that function body, the specialized function body. Now we just return the um, the specialized function ID. At this point, now it's no longer a decal ID. So we'll just call this the specialized function ID. Okay, so if we go back to um, eval definition, I think that kind of covers it. Um, let's go back to where we call this. And we can see we iterate over all the definitions with declaration phase true. Any errors that happen, we're going to push those. If we failed anything, we're going to go ahead and bail. I don't know if we even should. Maybe we should keep going, surface as much information as possible um, to the user in case there's other things they might want to fix before they, uh, before they recompile. But now we're just going to go back through the same definitions again with declaration phase false. And um, yeah, everything's pre-declared. So yeah, we already looked at that code path. Um, coming through here, if it's not the declaration phase, namespaces, there's very little work to do. All we're going to do for namespaces is um, look up. We're going to skip all this. We're just going to recurse down into the definitions to try and hit those function bodies we haven't done yet. The only one I haven't covered is type definitions. Type definitions is the same. We do all the work in the declaration phase. So a function's signature cannot depend on its implementation. That's a sort of design decision that, that I feel pretty strongly about here. So um, all we need is the signature. There's no way to leave off the return type and have the language guess it from what you implement. So this means that all of our type stuff can be done in the declaration phase. So that's what we do. And that is how I've added a second pass to the type checker to support um, out of order um, definitions and uh, multiple files through that. I didn't hit on the uh, interned expressions. It didn't really come up. It's just sort of an implement de implementation detail of the parser um, at this point. And to be honest, I don't love, I don't love how it 
turned out. Uh, but I, I have kept it because having the expression IDs is useful for a few things. Um, specifically, I'm about to do um, type descriptions, which I tried doing without the IDs. And I think that now that I have the IDs, that's going to be easier to implement. But I think I'll call the video there. Um, you know, we'll do it's compile a proj again and um, let's compile it with run. Da da da. Hello from root util. Hello from util. Hello. And of course, we're calling print line, which is in Prelude. <clears throat> ah, one more thing I do want to show. Dump module. So here, um, with that flag, this has been around. So um, all the types, their ID, and then a nice pretty print of them. The namespaces, you can see we have util here coming from that other file. The rest coming from prelude and root is root. All the variables that occurred, um, not really useful to look at this. Uh, because these can be in all sorts of different scopes. All of the functions. This is really great to see it working well because, um, well, I can see one specialization here of new. So this is a speciali specialization of array new, I believe, um, with char being one. Hopefully, yeah, char is type one. Yes, it is. But this is useful to see that specialization is working right. If I ran the the generic program here. Oh, I might as well go ahead and do that. Let's do test source slash um, generic inference or identity. Yeah, so if I run identity generic, the functions, we see identity and identity too. They're exactly what you think. They just take T return T. And then we see the specialized versions. So we have one of each of those for int, one of each of them for bool, and one of each of them for uh, a record with a value field of type int. So that's nice. The thing I added though is scopes. So now I can dump all the scopes and I added a way to generate names for them. So the function scope of this of this function, you know, this is its sort of path. So in root, there's a function called bfl char to string. In root.files, there's a function called read to string. And inside of that function scope, there, there's one argument called path. We can see path here. So there's a variable called path. In array, here are all the things that are declared. And then each of these functions have scopes as well. So we can see their scopes and see um, this is just going to be a really nice debugging tool for the future. So um, I'm glad I sort of proactively added it. See every if and else branch is a block. So it has a scope. And thus, you know, we'd see these in here. They see the um, array.equals.else. There's an else branch in array.equals with uh, two local variables, i and ret. So if you go into prelude, Here's um, array equals. We can see there is an else branch with two mutable variables, i and ret. Here. So I just thought that was neat, um, adding some tooling, um, printing out the scopes, because I was never really sure if they were correct. Uh, I never actually looked at them. I think being able to look at what's going on in a program like this is going to become a lot more important as things get more complicated. Well, that's all I wanted to share. I know a little bit maybe more boring, more of like a video log style than actually working on something. So, um, but you know, maybe there's something, some interesting things there if anyone's trying to solve these problems themselves or is just curious um, how it works or it's just helpful for me to, to catalog the progress and, and report on, on where things are. So yeah, if you've uh, watched this far, I, I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for, thanks for listening and for your interest and uh, catch you next time.